the internet is a vast network that connects computers all over the world through the internet people are able to send receive store and collect data across the world but how did it start it started with this guy and this guy well they are the inventors of the internet growing up i took a keen interest in tech but i always wondered how it all started who invented the internet who brought internet to africa who made it possible my name is genevieve derby allow me to introduce to you the man who brought internet to africa professor nikwenu guys i'm honored today to have professor nikwenu on my channel prof how are you doing i'm doing very well how are you i'm good okay so Prof, how did the journey start for you before you went into tech and after and also how, how was actually how was your childhood? Okay, I come from a relatively large family. Um, there were seven of us, all boys except one girl. Wow. Um, so I had the benefit of the uh, elders, the elders, so to speak. Okay. Uh, so it was a reasonable family, civil servant. Uh, head of household and but the children were all well educated okay. with high specialists and forestry people and, and so okay. on yeah okay so were you the last one i was not just before the last just before the last one yeah, my so sister was the last, last yeah. one. Oh wow okay yeah so which part of ghana did you grow up um we grew up in Adabraka area. Adabraka area, okay. Um, so in Accra. In Accra. Okay. Yeah, we're generally from Accra and uh, Aquapim area and Ningo. Mm. Yeah. Well, I know you went to Addis Adel College in mm -hmm. Achimota as well. Mm -hmm. Then later you schooled in um, the US. Mm -hmm. You also did your masters in the US. Okay, well, I left Addis Adel 66. 66, 1966. I, yes, and I oh. left Achimota 68. 68. Then I had a stint at Legon trying to do pre-medicine. Pre-medicine. And then I left and went to the U.S. for my uh, undergraduate and graduate studies till uh, 77 when I finished with my Ph.D. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Ph.D. Yes. So have you've always wanted to pursue a career in tech? Uh, not really. I thought I was going to be a good medical practitioner. But yeah. I did not do zoology at A level. So okay. when I went to pre medicine, I saw a handicap in okay. that my physics and mathematics were fine, but I hadn't been spending time with um, these biological things. I didn't do that at A level. So I left and wow. went straight to do this sort of thing. Well, did you go with um, scholarship or? Okay, at the time, yes, I did go with some level of scholarship. I think they call it partially funded or something, where yeah. the tuition is covered and then um, you have to work for your meals and, and your yeah. upkeep and so on. So I followed that path, yeah. You had some form of education here in Ghana and you went to the US. Yes. So how, how was the transitioning process for you? Okay, the transition process was um, quite normal because the physics and the, those strengths were quite strong okay um to the extent that i even got a year waved off because i yeah. took those exams that if uh, uh, they usually give you some number of uh, exams and depending on how well you do you can waive some number of courses off and so on. but i waved the whole year off yes yeah so it was good it. it's not a problem If you can access the internet somewhere in Africa, then perhaps you should thank Professor Nikwenu. As a renowned professor and of Ghanaian descent, Prof. Nikwenu is known as Africa's father of the internet, a web pioneer who helped establish some of the continent's first online connections. Prof, so why are you called the father of the internet? Well, it's difficult to tell why people give uh, others names, but yeah. it sounds like uh, I might have done some things which they considered were fatherly. I yeah. mean, at the time, I was the most educated 
and the most experience and I was teaching a lot and I was sharing a lot of knowledge and helping people get connected so and then building institutions for them as well in addition to um, maybe helping them by uh, sharing knowledge and uh, intellectual property and, and teaching and so on I was also building or uh, bringing them together to build um, the technical internet institutions the, like the places you go to get internet numbers um, uh, being with your colleagues that are training themselves we call them NOGs or yeah. um, maybe also with the community of CCTL these are domain names yeah. or even with the emergency response people or the research network so I went about building these institutions and uh, it brought everybody together. So. What inspired you to take that initiative? Because I know you said us at that time you were um, the only one that had that knowledge here in Ghana. You moving, you had the inspiration to come back to Ghana, but you went all over Africa. So what actually inspired you to do that? Because I understood the so-called digital divide in a way many never um, will understand. Um, when you know there's absolutely nothing on the whole continent and yet you are familiar, you know what to do, you've done it for your country, um, I think you may not stop there and uh, you help others. Of course, we didn't want to go into other countries by principle. We felt that we should share the knowledge with somebody else in each of the countries so that they can try to do it themselves and that would be more longer lasting because we knew the nature of the internet was community oriented and the knowledge is in the minds of people and so on and so forth so we part to follow that path yeah. Yeah. so before you started there was nothing like internet in here in ghana not or possible. africa not possible. nothing at all not possible. So that would be very challenging like so how did you go about it? did you consult some of the government agencies for help or Okay. I don't know how you went about it. <laughs> okay, first, there, there are two main hurdles, right? Well, three actually. The first is that you yourself should know what that thing is to do the engineering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that one, just the grace, okay? Yeah. Then you have to somehow convince the policy environment that they should not take you to jail <laughs> for doing those things. Yes, yeah. okay. Then the third level is you need to now have people trained uh, to help, help in that cause yeah. and you have to solve all three and wow. that's what it takes oh. yeah. so Ghana Ghana is actually the first country that you started with okay for me but at the time um, South Africa had first connected and Tunisia had, and connected. Then had also connected and then there was a rush to connect everybody else okay and uh, the approach was because we deal with open systems and open solutions and things okay. like that standards um, we decided to now help everybody I mean, the moment I got connected then we started preparing to form the network operators groups and the initiative to bring the NIC also established so we had to share across all over Africa we had to do it for all of Africa. Wow. Africa we had to convince our global partners to truly include Africa in the whole global internet system. Yeah. Fortunately, there were no barriers there. That was more a place where they were insisting we get ourselves organized to join. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I know in Africa, our systems clearly don't work. <laughs> and it's, sometimes it's sad, but we are evolving. And I, I feel as we evolve, we are definitely going to get there. Of which, among all the African countries, which ones did you face a lot of challenges um, in introducing the internet there or any of the systems? You know, actually, I think they all had various problems along the way. Mm -hmm. Some had them earlier and some had them later. Um, but in the beginning, when we were trying to push for initial connection and adoption, the hardest place really, in my opinion, was Nigeria. Nigeria. Nintel was uh, quite adamant um, because they were concerned about revenue losses um, and so on. I don't know how well they managed to transition, but that was uh, a relatively more difficult. Um, wow. The case Gambia was actually one of the best 
surprisingly, because they had a much more uh, enthusiastic cooperation between policy and the technical community, I thought. Yeah. The affable Prof. Kuinu has been at the forefront of web development across Africa for 20 years now. He is the first African to be elected to the board of ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, playing an important part in launching the African Network Operators Group. The company he started with was not Ghana.com, right? No. It wasn't Ghana.com. It was called Network Computer System. Around 2003, roughly about a decade of when we've had internet in Ghana, there were some uh, litigations over land, uh, mired in a fair amount of politics, um, and so on, uh, and some negative PR, which resulted in the, you might say, liquidation of the company. Liquidation of the company. Yeah, liquidation yeah. of the company. Because it, it did not make economic sense yeah. uh, by, by that time, even though we had the system surviving the, uh, uh, the situation, it did not make economic sense. Yeah. So a group of uh, you know, uh, employees decided that we should form a new one. A new one. But at that time, we could not, no longer compete on connectivity. Connectivity. Meaning putting cables, putting wires, yeah. and giving you know people access. We could no longer because the, uh, it has changed to become telco dominated. So we decided to focus on the soft infrastructure side, okay. which means things like the identifiers you need to run uh, an internet okay. web hosting or anything. Yeah. So we went more with domain names domain and names, yeah. uh, became accredited registrars and. Uh, now we are adding payments and so on, so that it becomes easier uh, for people who buy domain names can buy hosting and they immediately get their payments as well. So that's the Ghana.com. That's the Ghana.com. So Prof, if you said it didn't make economic sense, yes. that's what led to the liquidation of the company. Correct. I, can you please elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as an example, if your services are disrupted, and your customers are therefore trashed and they've moved to others, you can see from your revenues that yeah. it doesn't make any more economic sense. Okay. And this was a period in which uh, they were the dominant ISP with probably more than 50% market share. Okay. Um, so we, we felt it was not going to make sense so competing with them. The, the then telcos whom we established internet for have become stronger than you because we were also you know, denied our assets so to speak okay. so we moved into this new area using the email address of ncs which was ghana.com Ghana okay. so Bob, um then um th that this when in 2003 how many isps did we have in ghana as at the time Okay, it could have been still in the uh, hundreds or, in the hundreds. or near, yeah, it could, it could have been at that time, in that kind of number, yeah. And they were all under you, right? No, they, some were passing traffic through so, us, okay. but many of them were going directly as well. Okay, yeah, so, because so most were independent. Most were independent, small operators, okay. and then, the, of course, when we moved out, the telcos moved in, and then they are just pricing and dismiss them. What actually influenced the liquidation of um, your first company? But I know as at that time, it was one of the powerful companies <laughs> in the continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, was. Your name was known all over Africa. You went to different parts of Africa. So what actually influenced the liquidation of your company in Ghana? It's um, complex and perhaps several dynamics at play. Um, you might say telcos were obviously not very happy with some of the things I was doing. So that meant that uh, policy authority was also not favorable. Okay. Um, and this activity had been successful in the, you know, if you look at the time scale in the era of uh, late 
uh, Jerry John Rollins. So there are different factors as well. Um, also, the climate had been pent up at the time uh, to make it appear that um, we have you know, dominant resources. And so that also created its own anti-competitive um, sentiments. Yeah. Um, and there were lots of maneuvers to also grab lands in Accra. Okay. And uh, I'm sure some of the interests also fell on the particular properties that, that we had. Mm. Um, but amidst all this were several court cases uh, with many people claiming to own the property wow. and it went on, you know the usual story that we have in, uh, in, in lands in Ghana yeah. and, and, and this is an example of the impact of um, uh, maybe inappropriate or inadequate land reforms uh, and its impact on investments and innovation and so on. But anyway, the end result was that um, after somebody had been paid for um, you know, the years of rent during the time the litigations were on, then the person decided to come and just destroy the company, in my oh. opinion. And this is people who were very highly connected and uh, uh, maybe with superior uh, resources so to do yeah. also I mean, it just complicated situation. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a very sad situation. So the, yeah. this was in 2003. This was 2003, 2003. November 26 to be exact. November 26, 2003. Wow. So I, I'm just imagining. There were 87 staff at, the, at that time. You had 87 staff. 87 staff. They were doing business to the tune of $2.3 million a year. Wow. I feel maybe you were getting so powerful. <laughs> so maybe superior forces got it to bring you down a little. It's more like when a black man is getting more powerful, sometimes even more powerful than the government, the government tends to be scared or intimidated by just one person that is not affiliated with them gets more power. Well, you may never know what actually happened, but guys, you had <laughs> Prof. Lee Kuenu. And Prof, he said as at that time in 2003, your company was liquidated. So when was the next company established? Okay, it was established in 2007. 2007. Yes, and uh, we moved here in 2009. 2009. Yeah. So the first one was where? At Ridge. At Ridge. Ridge. Oh, okay, okay. So from Ridge to East Lagos, right? We came to East Lagos. Wow. And then we started afresh, and now we are doing good business. So the people that you are supplying to, what happened to them? The companies you are supplying to, what happened to them? Okay, some of them dragged us through courts, and uh, wow. some of them we settled, and uh, some of them with the liquidation, they themselves went and sorted things out with uh, uh, those who collected all the items. Yeah. Wow. So as at the time, how were you running, like the system, because <laughs> the internet now, you know, now there, there are new technologies, things have advanced. Uh, two things. One, how do your customers come in, and I'll mm. describe that. And okay. secondly, how do you take them to the internet? Yes. These are the two things. The customers coming in, we used to use um, uh, telephone lines, telephone lines. Okay. and the uh, modems. Okay. Similar to what you are doing yeah. today through the base stations, in a way, okay. it's the same thing. But the person will dial and then it will connect to our machines, which also have modems. And then they can then pick their mail or go outside. Okay. For going outside, and of course this means that if there is no phone lines, I have to find the phone lines from somewhere and oh. bring them yeah. to where I am. So we have to do secondary infrastructure to okay. bring the lines from different places to our location, maybe from GTA Grand North to Ridge, or okay. from Dema, Dema to Ridge, so that we can have more and more lines that serve people in their local community. So that was one side of the thing. The second side is techniques to connect to the international. We need to have permanent connection, which is always open. This one was like multiplexed, okay? this okay. one is permanently connected. Okay. The only well, the first one we could get was to get a lease line okay. through Ghana Telecom to connect to British Telecom 
and then join our upstream provider, which was mm -hmm. called Pipex. Pipex. Pipex at yeah. the time. So we got this lease line where we pay seven thousand five hundred dollars a month wow. to Ghana Telecom and five thousand pounds to British Telecom, and it was just nine point six kilobits per second. Wow. Nine point six, but it was permanently open. So if you dump your mail, we eventually will, will, will push it out. Okay. okay. And then we went ahead and bought uh, a smaller antenna and then we moved to 128 kilobits per second. So it was okay. getting better. And then the one you saw upstairs, we were then carrying, capable, capable of carrying over 40 mega, you know, megabits per okay. second only. So that's, uh, that was the evolution. So the satellite I saw outside was what you were then using in 2003. In 2003 to move, to connect us outside, outside right? Yes. Wow. All IP over satellite. Yes, IP over satellite. Okay. Wow. As a result of his laudable achievement, Prof. Queen was recently inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame, recognized as an instrumental figure in the early design and development of the Internet. Prof. Queno is now the chairman of Ghana's Information Technology Agency and a professor at the Cape Coast University of Ghana. What has been your biggest challenge so far? Okay, policy environment uh, to me has been the biggest uh, stumbling block all along the all way. Along, yeah. and it's not for anyone's fault, it's te new technology. It takes time for people to understand um, or even appreciate impact. But uh, what one needed to do was to allow the technology to run free till you have information on the impact. But oftentimes in our environment, we, we tend to want to stop it from, uh, which means there's a constant um, sort of barrier that you have to face and it happens in all the technologies um, so that that that's one then of course there's also the problem of getting critical mass for example what you are doing for it to scale needs that you accumulate some critical capacities in numbers of people in resources and yeah, equipment okay. and so on and it's relatively difficult to build that thing within our environment <clears throat> because there's such a vacuum that every set of people you train can be absorbed wow. which means they will tend not to stay in that yeah. place to grow more capacity they will tend to dissipate okay but we don't see it like that uh, but for them it's an opportunity so you finish the apprentice and if he wants to move on it's okay yeah. but but you also need to try to build and store the capacity so you can go to the next higher wave and it's fairly not so easy easy for us to do those are my uh, perhaps the biggest challenges tell us a little bit about ghana.com now i know you did you are doing some new <laughs> technologies here the kiosk so can you please tell us a little bit about it mm -hmm. Okay, um, we somehow are trying to bring um, uh, domain names as identifiers uh, together with some of the blockchain related identifiers. Meaning the philosophy is that all these identifiers, including those dealing with identity themselves, will over the long run be uh, merged in some way so that when uh, you yourself say that your next of kin is somebody it's done through the web and the okay. person will just go with their keys and then they will have access to all of these so in the long run that's what we see as the direction of combining of identities so we have you might say a web a web deployment stack which allows anyone to get a website uh, just trivially go to sahara.net and then you find a name you want from the international as well as from the Ghana one you can get a name then you can get the hosting then you can get the you know certificates that you need to keep things silent and whatever else you need you can get how do you see the future of tech in Ghana or in Africa as a whole I know Rwanda is doing a great job when it comes to their tech world Kenya is also trying to keep up 
most of the East African countries are trying their best, but when you look at West Africa, specifically Ghana, how do you see the future of technology? Okay, for me, I don't see much difference between the African countries. Okay. In other words, you really must look with a microscope, in my opinion, to see a difference. Okay. But um, there are some positive things in the Eastern Africa which we lack here. Yeah. Um, if, if you know that society, there are society that likes to discuss a yeah. lot and they have a history of um, various mailing lists and therefore the community kind of cooperation um, seems, from our point of view of multi-stakeholder bottom-up decision making, which is the basis of much of technology, um, I think they may be a bit ahead. Um, you know, around here, everybody is sort of trying to stay their lane. Yeah, and, sure. um, everyone is minding their and, business. And we don't have that yeah. cross-pollination. Sure. And as far as I know, knowledge is only retained in communities, not really in books. It's in the minds of people. And um, we are not doing that as, as well as I think we should, yeah. 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 And I think it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah. What I see, most people travel and they're not willing to come back to help mm -hmm, mm -hmm. their country, be it Ghana or any other African countries. Gone are the days where the likes of you will go and want to implement um, certain things that you see there, you want to implement it in your country. But now, people feel the government is failing, people feel the systems are not working. So, when you go and you establish yourself, why is it important for you to come back? Do you think that's also a problem that is going to affect um, us here in Ghana? Well, it's already a problem because um, when your good resources leave, um, we'll make do with the lesser quality resource we have. So it means that will not go as well. Okay. On the other hand, um, um, they can still contribute from there. I mean, yeah. We can provide them channels by which they can... Because I know many Ghanaians uh, have Ghana at heart. Okay. Uh, we may not agree on many things, but yeah. generally, I, uh, Ghanaians would wish well for Ghana, but sometimes yes. they may wish more for themselves, yeah. sure. um, which is something that we maybe we need to address. Because for me, it's more important to think of helping us than helping yourself. When you help us, it gets better for you. And mm. it, for me, that's being responsible. And we have yeah. to find a way to uh, tune our uh, thinking a little differently. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. That's great. What do you do outside your professional <laughs> life? <laughs> I know you travel a lot. Yes, yeah, I know I you move from country. You move. You yeah, mostly move within Africa and outside yeah, Africa around. too, as well. So, what do, what do you do outside your professional life? Well, I don't. I do what all of us do. Yeah, I enjoy traveling. <laughs> yeah. But I'm peculiarly a, a, a swordsman. Okay. I'm a, a well-trained Chinese a Tai Chi sword. Really? Yes. Wow, I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm a swordsman, so okay. I enjoy doing that um, because I, there's something about their things, that okay. and this particular thing that um, helped me during some of the major crises in the past, so I okay. still do it and I enjoy doing it. Yeah. Of course, you know, a good glass of something never yeah. hurts anybody. Yeah. Um, I just like the same thing about that. I like to dance. I like to, you know. <laughs> you know it's yeah. just normal life. Yeah. Normal life, normal yeah. life yeah. What advice will you give to the youth of today? And what should we take from your journey? And what should we do better? Okay. Well, what they always say is that you have to make good friends. They never tell you what that good is. But I think you want friends who will be frank with you, and especially when you are not seen, um, but are still willing to help you. I mean, because those friends will become maybe some of your uh, intellectual or you know other uh, pillars within your yeah. your life to come. So I think it's important to do that. 
um, at the same time it's extremely important to have independent thought okay, okay. Um, meaning you need to be able to convince your own self um, on what it is that you do or want to do okay because this business of following a crowd i think is as destructive as yeah. any of the other top-down power things perhaps lastly um, people should be kind of um, pragmatic okay um, you know meaning just uh, follow the normal you know straight common sense and be very practical um, and uh, be as hands-on as you can meaning you should be able to do things by your, yourself if there's nobody there and uh, eliminate as many of the dependencies uh, in the things you do as possible uh, if for instance your, your, your supply chain is dependent on uh, things being done from outside when political climate changes you may not be able to fulfill your supply yeah. chain so you should always strive to be you know uh, as independent as you can um, but yeah <laughs> just be be normal and you know just yeah. practical none of this kind of uh, high big English uh, will yeah. help you ultimately okay. it's about basic decisions and you yourself following them whatever they are I mean but in every profession you can be practical and the more practical you are for me I think the more success yeah thank you bro okay. I appreciate you coming on my channel no, no thank stop. you so much it's a pleasure <laughs> so.